You are listening to the Shopify Solutions Podcast, a podcast for Shopify store owners that brings you concrete examples on how to build and grow your e-commerce business. My name is Scott Austin, and I have an e-commerce agency named Jade Puma. In this podcast, I'll share my e-commerce insights and best practices with you. Hey everyone, Scott Austin here, and uh, this week what I want to talk about in our podcast episode is Google Ads, but my agency doesn't help our clients with ads. So I wanted to bring in an agency and an expert who does help people with ads, and that's Andrew Mapp. So allow him to introduce himself. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Scott. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so my name, as you said, Andrew Mapp. I'm the founder and CEO of Blue Tusker. We're a full-service digital marketing company for e-commerce sellers, primarily with Shopify sellers. Uh, I personally have been a Google Ads partner for, I think, seven or eight years at this point. I've been in the digital marketing space and running ads for a little over 15 years at this point. So this is pretty much all I know. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that I'm going to be able to provide some value today. But if I, if I'm not good enough, you, you just tell me. Okay. I will. Don't, don't worry. I'm, I'm known for being a little <laughs> bit too honest sometimes. Uh, so welcome. Great. And my audience in the podcast, it's all Shopify. So we're, we're aligned there. And my Perfect. audience is probably the smaller sh- stores, right? They're, they're just getting started. Mm-hmm. They're doing 10,000 a month, a hundred thousand dollars a month in revenue, you know, and some of them might be doing less than that because we're not doing the advertising yet. So what I want to do is talk about how would a Shopify store owner, who's probably you know a one or two person shop, it's not like they got you know a whole team of people there. How would they get started yeah. in this big monstrosity of Google and advertising? What, what are the steps they have to go through? What are the things they need to think about? The very first thing that you have to think about is to make sure that Google itself is a good channel for you. So I usually look at two different ones between usually your Facebook slash Instagram or Google. And the way that you can typically figure that out is knowing who your customer is and where they're at most of the time, or it comes down to your product line. So if you're in a wildly competitive space where there's, you know, maybe you're selling t-shirts, you're not going to do very well on Google because you're going up against like Hanes and Gap and these guys that are willing to pay an obscene amount on a cost per click. So it might be actually better to look at more of a Facebook ad side where you can present the differences of your product and why you're better than the others. Or you have the complete other end of the spectrum on that, which is it's something that no one knows exists. Maybe you invented a product, something along those lines. There's no search volume on Google, so it also doesn't work. But on a Google side, if there is search for it, you can run ads on Google. Google is the second largest product-based search engine next to Amazon. And 46% of all product searches come from Google. I actually just did like a webinar on this. So that's a that's a, an actual number. <laughs> so yep, yep. it's 46% of product searches come from Google. Most of the others are obviously on the Amazon side. So to ignore Google is a little ridiculous, right? Google is a very middle of funnel platform. People are actively searching for something. They're looking for the product. So if they're looking for it, they're going to convert at a much higher rate. You tend to have a higher conversion rate. The downside of Google is because of that and because of the limited real estate, you know that no one's leaving the first page. If they don't find what they're looking for, they just start the search over. So your cost per click is much higher. So you have to convert them faster. Otherwise, it gets very expensive. But to figure it out, it kind of all comes down to who is your customer, where are they at, and how are they trying to find a product like yours? Yeah, and I love giving examples so people understand because I understand the concepts you just said. I just want to give a couple examples. The first one is, you know, you talked about, well, if it's a new product and, and people don't know about it, like my favorite example for that is Tushy, right? They came out a few mm-hmm. years ago with bidets in the United States. Now, people overseas know what bidets are. But most people in the United States still don't know what a bidet is. And when Tushy came out, no one in the United States had any idea what a bidet is. So th- nobody was searching for bidets for my home. So they had to go and do the Facebook advertising, right? And the other way I talk about it is I call it the intended shopper and the unintended shopper, where Google's the intended shopper. They know what they're looking for. They're looking for men's size 13 running shoes. On Facebook, that's your unintended shopper. You're like trying to let them know, hey, I have this elite brand of running shoes and you target runners who aren't looking at this moment for shopping for new shoes, but you raise their interest. Is that, is that the way you think about it? Yeah, that's exactly the way I think about it. The only times when you can use Google from 
an unintended way would yep. be display ads. So you can run, you know, there are display ads where you land on, let's say like Buzzfeed and you see the little ads that are all over the place. That would be going after someone who's unintended. They weren't actively looking for your product, but you're showing it to them anyway. Yep. Or there is a different approach that you can do usually with search campaigns where you can actually create pieces of content and drive traffic to that page. So let's, let's just say it's a, you did bidets, right? Let's say it's uh, the top 10 things to have in your bathroom and you're running an ad on that, on that keyword. And mm-hmm. then you're just targeting maximizing clicks, which I'm sure we'll touch on. And what you're doing is you're just trying to get as much traffic to that page as possible. And then you're letting your retargeting ads do the work. That's really the only other way that you can kind of get unintended shoppers, but it's a way to get a relevant audience to your site, pixel them and then retarget them later. Oh, I, I hadn't thought of that one. I really like that a lot. Like, you know, the, searching for bathroom ideas and then that's where you you build that awareness about your bathroom product so it's a mm-hmm. step removed from your actual topic but completely under the umbrella i, I like that yep so now i have decided as my shopify store owner that i'm going to start off with you know google ads in the search space how would i go about getting started if i've never done this before okay so you've never done this before um so let's go on the assumption that like you've got absolutely nothing right so we've got your shopify site is set up and go well, and to be clear, by absolutely nothing, because I, I think this becomes confusing for a lot of store owners, and I have no Google accounts created. Like, which systems okay. do I have to go create accounts in? How do I connect them? Because that's kind of a nightmare when you're first getting started. Yep. So there's technically three things you're going to want to create. You Google Analytics, right? That should be relatively straightforward. That's usually one of the first things you create when you have a Shopify account, start getting all that data and track that. Obviously, now that's got to go over to GA4. I think that's for a different podcast. Uh, so then we have Google Merchant Center. So Google Merchant Center is going to connect to your catalog on Shopify. So when you see those shopping ads, so let's say you're searching, you know, bidets and the first like four or five things up at the top of Google are all pictures right there. Those are your shopping ads. So Google Merchant Center is going to be what connects to all that. So if you create a Google Merchant Center account, Shopify actually has a very easy integration with it now. So it's actually a sales channel. So if you do a sales channel, you search for Google, it will walk you through the wizard to just connect your Google Merchant Center with your Shopify account. And then from your Google Merchant Center side, if your Shopify is already set up the way it should be, it'll pull in all your tax information, all your shipping information, all that fun stuff. And you're pretty much in a good spot to get started from there. And then of course you you need your Google Ads account. Do you have pretty good success with a new store with the Google Merchant flow working the the wizard walking you through and and like you get all the settings right or do you actually have to spend a lot of time tweaking those out to get it to work no it's super easy now if you had asked me that question i want to say about six months to a year ago i would have said like "Ah, it needs a little love sometimes but shopify actually got rid of uh the sales channel that they had they then just let people use a third-party app that existed and then they fixed their sales channel and now it's quick and painless so it, it takes 30 minutes if that that's awesome that's awesome because i've had experiences in the past where it wasn't so challenging when would someone not use the automatic feed from shopify to google and instead do their own manual feed would, would any new store owner do that or is all the new store owners just going to use the standard in the box shopify one you almost never want to do a manual feed because google needs to be able to know where you're at with inventory And so like manually doing that, like you're not going to, it's not scalable by the time, you know, you start to actually sell through, you're going to want to like keep updating Google with where things are at. So it's just not worth it. You can get a little bit deeper into things like using something like a GoData feed where it actually comes out of Shopify into GoData feed and then into Merchant Center. The only real reason that a lot of people use that kind of stuff is if they have an extremely large product line where they're kind of playing with pricing or maybe they're adjusting certain tiers for certain shipping thresholds or the thing that gets your shopping ads working as well as possible is the data that's being pulled out of your Shopify. So it's usually your meta title and meta description or it's your page title and your page description. You can pick which one you want it to be. If you use one of those integrators where it actually pulls out of Shopify and you have a third party in between Shopify and Merchant Center, you can manipulate a lot of that stuff there. So it becomes a little bit more like tweaking keywords and titles, et cetera. That's the only other reason. But to me, if that data is actually coming out of Google Merchant Center, 
and it's telling me like, hey, you should use this keyword more often or something like that, then I'm actually just going to go change it in Shopify because if it works for Google ads, it will work for SEO as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you had mentioned, I kind of talked over, so I want to remind the audience, there was a third account and that was the Google ads. So you, you create your Google analytics, your Google yep. merchant and your Google ads. Do you have to connect those at all? Yes. So all three of them pretty much need to be connected to each other. So you can connect your Google ads directly to Google Analytics. So within Google ads, in your settings, there's an integrations area uh, or an account access area, I believe is what it's called now. And that will connect directly to Google Analytics. It will also give you the opportunity to connect to your Google Merchant Center. And then, of course, you're also going to want to take the pixel that they provide you and put that on your Shopify to connect to Google ads and Shopify. Nice. So then now that I got my three accounts created, what's the next thing I'm going to do? So let, let's uh, stay on the setup. So you have the pixel. You have two different pixels that Google Ads is going to give you. You have a global one. So basically a code that goes across your entire website. So in fact, if you go into your, uh, your Shopify, you go into themes and you go into, I think it's the theme.liquid account. It's basically you put it into the header and it goes across everything. Then you need to create your conversion pixel. So basically, once your targeted thing happens, you want this pixel to trigger. In this case, we're just obviously we'll stick to purchases. So you can create a purchase focused pixel within Google Ads. They give you that information. It's a little code. And you actually can go into your Shopify, into settings, and in the, I believe it's under general all the way down, you have your Shopify checkout where you can insert the additional code. You can put the code in there. Shopify does have some, it's a bunch of different like FAQs and things that you can look through. There's a way that you can manipulate the code so that your purchase value comes into Google as well. Because what will happen is if you do the conversion event, you just put it into Shopify, it will tell you if someone converted, but it won't tell you how much they paid. So you won't be able to paint the ROI picture, but you can see what your CPA is, so your cost per acquisition. If you tweak the code so that it can also bring in the purchase value, then you can actually pull in your ROI data within Google Ads. And both the, the code snippets for those are in Google Ads. That's where I will get that information from to drop into my theme. Correct. Okay. And then what do we, what do, we do next? Now, that, so is our setup complete at that, t that moment? At that time, pretty much everything is set up. So now is the fun part. So now we go into the campaigns. So to me... For a, an e-commerce seller, there are two different types of campaigns you have to consider. You have your shopping ads, which is basically why you set up your merchant center, and you have your search ads. You also have YouTube ads, and you also have display ads. I personally find display ads to be great for retargeting and, and like brand awareness, but otherwise not really necessary. So based on assuming that these are sellers that are just starting off, don't worry about it. Do your retargeting on Facebook and Instagram. YouTube is very, very top of funnel, and you have to have some great creative to get someone to even click, let alone purchase. But it can also be very inexpensive from just in getting eyeballs and the brand awareness. So for the sake of just getting brand awareness, it's great. But if you're a newer seller and you need to bring in money and you you know you got to start bringing revenue in so that you have the capital to continue to invest, that type of that type of top of funnel stuff is not that necessary. So. For the sake of that, I'll stick to shopping ads and search ads for now. So you want to figure out which direction you want to go in. The shopping well, so ads... To, to just summarize what you just said there, because I, I like that focus. Basically, what I heard you say is, as a new store, think about targeted customer acquisition that is a step or two down the funnel instead of trying to do top of the funnel brand awareness type of stuff. Exactly. If you think of uh, YouTube display ads, some types of Facebook ads, like anything that's extremely top of funnel where you can't really paint the picture of the ROI from it. Like you think of traditional marketing back in the day, you have billboards, TV commercials. You can't really decipher what the actual return was on that because you don't know if they saw the commercial or how many billboards they saw before they converted. Like you don't know that kind of stuff. That's all very top of funnel brand awareness. And that's what display ads are, what YouTube ads are, what some of the Facebook ads are. While yes, you can click and you can convert, it's still very top of funnel. So to be able to paint that ROI is really difficult. So from a Google ads perspective, especially for newer sellers, if you're sub like, let's say two or $3 million a year, you're gonna wanna be focused on 
where can I spend my money to bring in more money before I start looking at, okay, how do I do more of like a spray and pray approach? Yep. Yep. Makes total sense. Yeah. So the setup, we're looking at shopping ads or Google ads, right? Or I'm sorry, shopping ads or search ads. So let's start with shopping ads. The reason I always look at shopping ads is because the average person is a visual shopper. If they see what they're trying to find, they're much more likely to click on that than read anything. So if you can get the shopping ads working, that's usually your best bet in the beginning. However, like I mentioned before, if you're in an incredibly crowded space or maybe you're drop shipping a bunch of like inexpensive stuff that makes it kind of tough, like there's a few different directions that can go in where shopping doesn't work out as well. But from a shopping perspective, you've got two options. You have traditional shopping ads, or you have now what Google does, which is their Performance Max. So Performance Max is working very well for a lot of people and for newer sellers who want to set stuff up and just kind of do the set it and forget it thing. Performance Max actually is one of the nicer automations I've seen come out of any of these platforms. The benefit of Performance Max is you pull in all your product data, you give it some assets, you give it some headline copy, you give it some descriptions, and then it just does everything else for you pretty much. You can create things within Performance Max that are called asset groups. So let's say, um, I'll use a, a client of ours as an example. He's a very large uh, collegiate apparel seller. So he sells a ton of different like college t-shirts and sweatshirts, all that stuff. He's all licenses, so like that's his focus. We have his performance max campaign for college broken down by team. So I can actually see each individual asset group, which acts similar to an ad group, how each of them are doing, how each team is doing. And then I can break it down by product and see like, hey, these are your top five Alabama t-shirts. I'm just going to stop running ads on the other ones because they're wasting money. These are our top sellers and I can just cater the budget to that. Google will do all the work from there. So there's no keywords to work with. There's nothing from that direction. It's all a matter of tweaking the way that you have your asset group set up and then the way that you're playing with which products you're running ads on versus which ones you aren't. Google, you pick whatever you choose your budget to be for the Performance Max campaign, and it will spread it out across it as it sees necessary based on your target. So with, with Google you've got several different campaign targeting options. You've got maximize clicks. You have a uh, target CPA. You have target ROAS. You have target impressions. And I might be missing one off the top of my head. Those are the ones we usually use. Oh, and then you, of course you have your manual bidding, right? So you tell Google what you want your goal to be. Most of the time, I'm going to select maximize conversions in the beginning. Then I'm going to wait and see what happens. When I do maximize conversions, I'm telling Google, I want you to get me as many conversions as possible, and I don't care what it costs. If you do target ROAS, basically what you're telling Google is, I want to make as much money as possible, but I want you to hit this target. It works very, very well, but you have to think in the beginning, you need to teach Google. So if you start off with maximize conversions, Google's going to get as many conversions as it can. You can see, okay, what is my cost per acquisition or what is my current ROAS based on the amount of conversions that Google's getting? And then you can go to your target ROAS and tweak it. So whether you're like, okay, I want a three and a half X, I want a five X, you can play with that and see what's necessary. If for some reason you're doing maximize conversions and you're not getting that many sales to actually make that kind of assumption, you then backtrack and you go to maximize clicks. You're going to get a lot of traffic and they may not convert, but it will start to tell Google who's interested in clicking on you. Then you go back to maximize conversions and then you go back to target ROAS. That makes sense. Now on this performance max, this is in Google ads, not in Google merchant, correct? Correct. Google Merchant Center, once you set it up, really its sole job is to be able to pull the data out of your shopping cart, so in this case Shopify, and put it into Google Ads. The only other time that you really need to play with Google Merchant Center is if, A, you need to go in there and kind of optimize some of your product titles and descriptions so that you can get in some better data, or B, if you're doing a discount, you're doing a campaign, something along those lines, you can actually do a discount through Google Merchant Center. So if you're doing like a 10% off all products kind of thing, it will actually showcase it sometimes on the shopping ads or on the search ads. 
in Shopify, the nice thing is if you create a discount within Shopify's native discount app, I guess it's not like it's not a third party app. It's what what Shopify has. Yep, yep. If you create a discount in there, you can actually select to feed that directly to Google and you don't have to do anything. It'll do it directly in Merchant Center. So Merchant Center for Shopify sellers, a lot of times is a set it up and then just never look at it again. And the, well, the reason I asked that question about the Performance Max one is because you had mentioned you would create these groups that include different products. Mm -hmm. How are you creating that definition of products in Google Ads, or does it get that information directly from Google Merchant already? So all that data comes out of Shopify, goes into Google Merchant Center, and then goes over to Google Ads. So you can actually sort within Google Ads all the data that comes in. So like for them, because we have it tagged by college, I can sort by college, or I could sort yeah. by apparel type. I can sort by t-shirts and sweatshirts and pillows, et cetera. So you can actually sort and filter all of that within Google Ads. So Google Ads is fully aware of your product catalog. That's, that's awesome. Correct. Yep. Exactly. From a performance max perspective, a lot of the optimizations come with tweaking the products that you're showing, uh, turning on and off different asset groups depending on time of year, playing with your targeting. So whether it's a target row as where you want that target to be, and then A-B testing different creative and headline copies and stuff like that that you give it. So all that like keyword heavy lifting and bid adjustments, et cetera, you let Google do that. If you're a new seller and you're just starting off, I always suggest doing it because you can set it up and Google does a decent job at it. When you get to a point where you're like, okay, now I want to like, it's time to really focus on this and do this right. Now you're looking at the manual shopping ads. Everyone's got their own theories on how to do this. Of course, I have my own. So this kind of comes into like, how do you structure stuff? How do you get things to set up? Blah, blah, blah. There's three different types of traditional manual shopping ads. You have your high priority, your medium priority, and your low priority. And the way that we like to run our ads is setting that up as a funnel structure. So you start with a high priority. So just like I said with Performance Max, you start your campaign, you pull in all of the shopping data. For Google shopping ads, it's solely just the shopping ads at the top. Google Merch, I'm sorry, Google uh, Performance Max will actually also do a little bit of display. It will do a little bit of search. It will use almost all of its real estate. If you do manual shopping ads, it's just shopping ads, nothing else. And if you start off with a high priority, basically what that means is you're pulling in all of your product data. You're starting off where you're telling Google, these are all a high priority for me. So it's going to show it as much as physically possible, and it's going to get you as many clicks and impressions as it possibly can. What you then want to do is you leave that campaign running until you start to get some kind of conversions. Once you figure out, let's say, okay, this, uh, this Alabama t-shirt has converted, I usually say at least three times, because to me, one is just a odd two could be a coincidence, three tends to be a trend. So once I've got three conversions, you'll actually go and you'll negate that term, which sounds odd. But then what you do is you create another shopping campaign, but you set this one to a medium priority and you set the bid for that keyword, I'm sorry, for that product, a little bit higher than the other one. Because what's gonna happen now is it's going to ignore the high priority and it's just gonna go to the medium priority so now you're really hyper-focusing on that one keyword for this one product. You're then going to repeat that same process and do a low priority. So you have your Alabama t-shirt in a high priority, right? You find out it's doing well. You get like three or four conversions. You negate it. That drops it down into a medium priority where Google's going to only really show it for the keywords that you knew you wanted to go after. Then you're going to do that again. You're going to drop it into a low priority. At this point, you are essentially hyper-targeting on one specific keyword that has converted very well. So you think when you do search ads, which I'll touch on in a minute, you type in a word, you give it to Google. That's, the, that's what it's going to show for, right? And depending on the phrase match, all that fun stuff. Shopping ads, it doesn't work that way. Shopping ads, it shows you for what it thinks you should be showing for. So you actually have to go and remove everything that you don't want it to show for. You don't give it to Google. So by doing this funnel structure and getting it into a low priority, you can actually hyper-focus on individual keywords by bringing them down to the low priority. And then you just negate that back up the funnel. So let's, uh, let's say it's Alabama t-shirt converts 
three or four times in my high priority, I'm going to negate it, drop it down to a medium priority. As soon as I see that it's converting again three or four more times, I'm going to drop it down to a low priority. And that has now been negated in the medium and the high, which means the only place that I'm going to show for that keyword is in my low priority campaign where I'm going to put a good amount of budget and a pretty high bid because I know that I convert really well for that keyword for that specific product. Does that make sense? No, of course not, because Google stuff <laughs> is so complex. I mean, what you said is, is it totally makes sense, but I'm putting it together in my head. So if I understand it is we're in Google Merchant as we're talking shopping ads, right? Or is that still no, in everything's ads? everything's within Google Ads. Okay, okay. So in Google Ads, the the thing that I heard you say was with these shopping ads that you're not in control of where it shows, but you are in control of where it does not show. So for example, with Alabama mm -hmm. T-shirts, you might say you know, I don't want to show for Alabama because that's just too broad of a query, right? And, you know, you might have an Alabama t-shirt and not want to show for an Alabama rolling tide or something t-shirt. And, you know, so you get to say this, this is just not a relevant keyword for what I'm going for. So you're managing the exclusions, Correct. not the includes, right? So it's an opposite way of thinking about it. And then you're also saying once you become more and more conscious of what it is that's working, you get to decrease that priority, but increase the spend. And that's, that's the part of understanding like, what is decreasing the priority, but increasing the spend get for me? Decreasing the priority is really just Google's like, like they, the way that they have the naming nomenclature can be sometimes, it feels like it's backwards. Like it should be the other way around. But basically what you're doing is you're telling Google, this campaign is a high priority, so I want you to focus on this one. But if I tell keyword, if I tell Google, like, not this keyword, though, it's going to go to the medium priority. I'm going to be like, okay, so now when people search this keyword, I'm going to go to this medium priority. And that medium priority, I have a little bit of a higher bid because now I'm confident. And I'm going to let that keep coming in. I'm going to test it out a little bit more. And if it starts to do well again, and I go, okay, this one's working great, perfect. I then negate it out of my medium priority drop it into my low priority. My low priority, because now I've told Google, don't show for this keyword in the high priority, don't show for this keyword in the medium priority. There's no mess. It's all basically bringing my top keywords into one campaign. So that's where I wanna put my bid at a pretty high level where I know that I can make some money based on my conversion rate. And then I wanna make sure that my budget has plenty of room to run because I've now proven out that that keyword converts. So the high priority is basically you want to give it focus. You want go Google to give it focus so that you can get the data. And then once you have that data, you can make a more educated decision. Therefore, you don't need to focus on gathering as much data anymore because you're more confident with the data that you have. Is, is that a way to think about it? Yeah, exactly. It's Google's high priority, but the low priority is actually my high priority because <laughs> yes, I want yes. all my fa I want all my best words in one place. That's all I want to show for, and I want to be number one every time. So it's a little complicated because of the way Google names it, but that's it, you, if you think of it as like a funnel and you want to bring the products down the funnel and you want to negate the terms up the funnel. Yep. Yep. I mean, that does make sense. Yep. So as you get started and we start thinking about spend, how much should we be spending and what should we be <laughs> measuring in these early days to, to measure this success? Cause you know, a lot of people are a bit concerned about, you know, spending $10,000 and making $500 in sales. Yeah. Oh, that question. <laughs> so <laughs> I answer that question probably three or four times a day and everyone reacts to it differently. Um, my answer is always that it depends, which is the marketing guys cop out answer for everything. But when you're but just starting accurate all the time, yeah, too. that's exactly like, like you don't want me to tell you it's 10 grand because then you're gonna be like, okay, I'm just never going to do it. And then you're going to go find some freelancer who's like, oh, you can do it for a thousand dollars a month. You're like, okay, then go for it. But you're just going to spend money slower and painful. So figuring out your budget, if you're just starting off, right? Like we haven't run Google ads before in this scenario. It's completely new. I always say this. I'm a, I'm a relatively conservative business owner. I, I take my handful of risks, but I like to go in thinking the worst is going to happen. So anything outside of that's great. If I'm going into a Google ads account and I'm going to start running ads, I always say, go into the, go into it with the mindset that you're not going to sell anything for two to three months. 
It's not fun. It's not the way that people like to hear it, but go with that assumption. If that's true, how much are you willing to spend to learn? You're basically paying to educate yourself. The chances of you not converting at all are basically slim to nil because after, like, if someone's optimizing it quick enough, it doesn't happen. But if you go in with that mindset, you'll be much happier. Now, there's a pro and a con from an agency side because, and I'm sure you know this, if I tell someone, hey, you should spend $10,000 a month, right? And, you know, my fees are X. Well, if you're going to spend $10,000 a month, you're going to run out of cash if you only have fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 to work with in a month and a half, two months, and then you're out of cash and that didn't work out at all. But then you look at the other side of it where, okay, I only spend $1,000 a month, but you have my fees. So now it's going to take us that much longer to learn and you're going to have to pay me the entire time while we're trying to learn. So you have to find that nice little middle ground of how can we get in enough data to figure out what's working and how can we make sure that it's it's lucrative while we're trying to figure it out while you're also prepared as a business owner that it may or may not do as well as you'd like it to. So the way that you try to figure out your budget comes down to a handful of things. You can do some keyword research through something like SEMrush or, you know, Ahrefs or SpyFu or like any of those, do some keyword research, see what their perceived average cost per click is for, let's say the first like five or 10 words that you know you want to go after, right? You figure out what that average cost per click is. Then you look at your website and you look at what your conversion rate is. I usually will double my conversion rate for Google ads. So if your conversion rate is uh, 2%, 3%, which tends to be the average, I usually say Google ads is going to convert closer to like four or six because someone's actively looking for it. They're ready to purchase. Typically it's four or six. So, okay, now let's go with that conversion rate. So now what's your average order value, right? So we've got how much it's going to cost to get someone there. I have how often that person's going to convert. And then I have how much I'm going to make on that. So as long as we understand that, I can get a general understanding of, okay, my average cost per click is $5. It's going to take, uh, you know, a hundred people to get to the site. That's $500. I have a 4% conversion rate. So that's four conversions. Uh, each conversion is $20. I'm going to make 80 bucks. Is that justifiable? Probably not. So you have to kind of figure out where you're going to go with that. So then that's where you start to go. Okay. Maybe these aren't the keywords I want to start with. Maybe I want to go a little bit more long tail where the cost per click might be a little bit lower, or maybe my strategy needs to be a little bit different. So my cost per click is lower. So figuring out your budget is, especially when you haven't done it before, is an art. I do usually have a general rule of thumb is if you're going to spend less than 2000 maybe less than 3000 a month on any platform, it's almost not worth it. You got to spend about $100 a day to just have enough in place because the other thing that you have to think about is your product line. If you have a really big product line, that's just that much more data that's going to come in. So for you to spread a hundred dollars a day across 15,000 products. Like it's a total waste and it's just not going to do well. So then you have to like segment that out. So it comes with a lot of discussion around what's going to work. But at the end of the day, it's what can the business afford to pay just to learn what's going to happen. And uh, the best piece of advice in all of that was if you're going to do this, do it right. And to do it right starts at $3,000 a month. That was my takeaway from what you just said. Like, yeah, and, I mean, and it that makes sense to me. It's like you need to put enough energy behind it, energy being dollars in this case. Unfortunately, they're they're one to one relationship, in order to get enough data to be get an accurate feel for is this system and platform working for you or not. Yeah, exactly. Like you, it, there's so many dependents, especially when it comes down to cost per click. So I used my uh, college apparel guy as a reference. His average cost per click can be like two or three dollars, maybe a dollar twenty in some cases. It's it's nothing crazy. I have some B2B e-commerce clients, fifteen, twenty dollars for one click. Just one person to come to your site is twenty bucks. So it it, it kind of comes into like, okay, there's a lot of different factors. Can you start Google ads at ten dollars a day? Absolutely. You can do anything you want. Doesn't mean it's gonna do well. And you got to think if your average cost per click is $2 and you're spending $10 a day, your ads are gone after five clicks. The stuff's going to turn off by 8 a.m. So it's kind of like you got to figure out if you want to do the platform, you got to do it right, which means you got to yep. put some kind of budget behind it. Yeah. And it, you know, a similar thing that I tell all my clients and the stuff that I work on, like in Clavio, you have the ability to set up AB emails. 
And mm -hmm. in Google Optimize, we set up A-B tests. But you need enough traffic through your site to get enough data. I've run so many Google Optimize uh, tests where it was inconclusive in the end because there wasn't enough flow through it kind of thing. You just need data exactly. to be able to make smart decisions. You can spend less, but then you don't get the value of the information and the data that helps you make the decisions to optimize things. Exactly. So if we're spending, you know, $3,000 a month and, you know, we're, we're investing in this with, with enough energy, how should that store owner be looking at that first couple of months? What metrics are important for them to be measuring? A um, couple things. ROI is obvious, right? That one, pretty straightforward. Let's, let, let's define that one for the people that don't know it. How, what's the math you use for that? So your ROI from a Google Ads perspective is usually pretty straightforward. How much did you spend? How much did you get? Yep. Pretty much, pretty black and white. And Google you start AdWords will give that to you, correct? They do correct. the math Google Ads, yep. Google Ads will give that to you. Um, you start to incorporate other channels, that question becomes a little bit more challenging. Um, but from a Google ads perspective, a lot of times people are going to click and they're going to buy. So most of the time that's going to be how that works out. When you incorporate other channels, it gets a little muddy, but for the sake of this, we'll stick to that. The other thing the that I the really way like I always to tell my clients about that one is every tool overestimates their number, but it's directionally accurate, right? Like, like Clavio's Correct, yeah. number for how much money it earns me is false, but it's directionally accurate. Yeah, so you think uh, uh, Clavio, right? They give you a lot of credit for someone who saw an email and yeah. then purchased within X amount of time. You can play with the attribution, yep. right? Yep. It's the exact same thing through Google Ads. So Google Ads comes set as a one, uh, one click, seven day, a seven day view through and a one day click, click yep. through. So basically, if someone clicks on an ad, I, I flipped that around. I'm sorry. Seven day click, one day view through. There we go. So if someone clicks on a button, clicks on your product, and purchases within seven days, Google will automatically take credit for it. If someone sees an ad, doesn't click on it, does nothing, but then makes a purchase from you, Google will take credit for it. Yep. It's the way that most advertising channels are, are taking their credit for attribution. So when you start to incorporate things like Facebook ads and things like that, it gets a little muddy because someone might click on a Google ad leave and not convert go to facebook get hit with a retargeting ad they'll click on the on the retargeting ad purchase and then both platforms are taking credit yes so that's when you start to look at like okay what's my total advertising versus my total revenue and then you're looking at what some amazon sellers refer to as like a tacos so your yep. total advertising cost of sales or you can look at it as like a total row as depending on how you want to look at that so, and like like i always tell my clients this is like it's directionally accurate. Just, you know, if you add up everybody's attribution, it's more than 100%, but that's okay because it gives you enough information. I'm always yeah. a fan of take whatever data you got and make decisions from it instead of bitching about the quality of the data that you have. Yeah, exactly. It, it, there's a, oh, this, we could go down a whole rabbit hole on this one, but <laughs> like basically, like you got to think too, like if I limit Google, like Google lets you say, like, hey, I want a one day click and a one day view through, and I just like, I only want you to take credit for what you get me. Sure, you can do that, but you're going to completely screw your entire account because now Google has less data to work with. So yep. now it doesn't know who's most interested. Like, ah, they were interested, but I'm going to take credit because they saw it. You don't know that someone saw your ad and then that's what made them purchase. So there has to be that brand awareness side to it. Yeah. Um, but I digress because that'll, that'll send me down a rabbit hole. Um, then you have the next thing I'm, I'm usually interested in looking at is your conversion rate from Google directly and your click-through rate. So again, it's kind of like a funnel, right? You look at your click-through rate is like the bottom of the funnel. How many people saw my ad and how many people clicked on it? If I have a relatively high click-through rate, I know that the people I'm targeting are interested. If I have a high click-through rate and they're coming to my website, but I have a low conversion rate, that tells me that there's probably a, con a website problem and not a Google ads problem because I'm well, targeting the right person. I'm sending them to the website, but they're still not pulling the trigger. So yeah. that means that tells me like, okay, it could be a pricing issue. It could be obviously like a website speed. There could be a billion other things that are wrong with the site. Um, but that's where I start to draw the line of where is this a Google issue and where is this a website issue? Yeah. The way I explain that to, to my clients is, you know, the, the click through, that's judging the quality of your ad, right? 
and mm -hmm. then the you know the, the conversion rate that's judging the quality of your product and your site i don't like calling it just a site problem because it might actually be a product problem right your site might be yeah. absolutely fine but they actually get to the product and then they read the reviews or whatever so it's you know it could be any one of those things that you know because when i hear the word site problem i get a little defensive of this because it'll work on the most like no the site's not yeah. broken um but it, it could be the product and the offer or just not fulfilling the promise right the ad could have been, you know, come see the world's best Alabama T-shirt in, you know, but then it's only available in size extra small when they get to the site, those kind of things. Exactly. That's that's the only other part about a click-through rate that can be sometimes kind of like you got to be careful with it because if you're getting a high click-through rate, that usually tells you that you're targeting the right audience. They're interested, so they're clicking. However, if your copy in your ad is come see the world's best Alabama t-shirt and they get there and it's just, it's not, then they're not going to convert. So while your ad is getting a lot of a relevant audience, it's also kind of lying. So it's yeah, your, yes. just because they're interested doesn't mean that's what you're offering. So that's why you actually usually will see a really low click through rate for um, shopping ads because a, there's a bunch of them and it's visual. So they can see exactly what they were searching for. If it's not what they want, then they don't click on it. Shopping ads usually has a really high click through rate because you can be very specific about the keywords you want to search, you want to click on, but they don't know what they're going to see until they get there. Yep. Well, and one of the things that I've, I've noticed with the, the Google merchant level shopping ads, right? The, just the straight product photo ones is a lot of my clients who are, you know, shipping products that they don't make themselves. They're using the same photo that the manufacturer gave them and all mm -hmm. their competition does. So all eight photos look literally exactly the same sometimes. And I'm like, yeah, just change the background color or something, please. So that's part of the problem. Actually, you can't do that. Yeah. So Google has a rule in place that it has to be on a white background. There's a handful of categories where Google will allow you to have a background. Um, for example, you have behind you picture frames, like it allows some, uh, home decor stuff to be in a home decor scene simply because if I just, if you just had a picture of that, I'd be like, I don't know. It could be a vacation. I don't know what you're selling. So yep. they let you paint the picture of like, okay, this is a no pun intended. They let you showcase that this is on, you know, this is a wall. It's, it's meant for a picture frame, that kind of thing. But most products have to be on a white background. So for you to stand out amongst your competition from a shopping perspective, that's going to be price point. It's going to be any pre-existing brand awareness you were able to get out of that or the reviews that you show on there. And then you also have the additional little snippets where it could say like free shipping or, you know, get it delivered within X amount of days or we have a sale going or something like that. I wasn't aware of the requirement that the Google Merchant photo be the I, I call that the Amazon photo, the white background one. Um, Same and thing. Google Merchant, if I remember correctly, that's pulling your first product photo from your, your first variant, correct? Correct. So you have to make sure those are all set up with the white background? Correct. Okay. So it's almost the exact same rule on Amazon. Yep. Their categories are a little bit different, and like some they allow, but on Google they don't, but it's very rare. And does that have to be just a pure product photo, or can that T-shirt be being worn by a model? So in, a, in the apparel space, it can be worn by a model. Um, in other spaces, let's say like hats and shoes, I don't know. I think that they can't. I think it's only t-shirts and like uh, a pair, like a, like upper body, like t-shirts, sweaters, jeans, and stuff where you can get away with that. And if you're already. violating that, will Google Merchant let you know and give you time? Yeah, it just won't show it. And then yep. in Merchant Center, it will tell you how many products you have approved versus how many products you have disapproved. Yeah, I just never, I'd never noticed the disapproved reason being you have a colored background. So I'll have to look at that for my clients. Look, at, I'm learning yeah. here. This is awesome. <laughs> Glad I can help. So we're talking about measuring, and, and I think three metrics is more than enough, right? The first one was the ROAS, how much money did you spend versus how much money did you make? Now, do you like delivering that as a number or a percentage? Do you like to do a four or is it a 0.25? <laughs> I just do it. Uh... Uh, so our spreadsheets, I have it literally every single way that you could possibly want it. So because we're so we're full service. So we work with sellers that are also like on Amazon or they're on Walmart or something. Yep. So they might be really used to like the ACOS and the tacos and that kind of stuff. So we'll do ACOS and tacos for Facebook ads, even though like 
if you're just a Shopify seller, you have no idea what I'm talking about right now. It's everyone's talking about the same thing. It's just for some reason, Amazon years ago started their own acronyms and messed up the whole thing. ROI, ROAS, ACOS, it's all relatively the same thing. Yep. Yep. And then the other two metrics were the click through, and that's a, a determination of how good your targeting is. And I would say also how good your ad is, right? The copy of the ad in, in the presentation. And then your site conversion, which is a function of how good your product is, your offer and your site and let your checkout button works and all, all that good stuff. Correct. And you said earlier that I should be seeing a better conversion on site through my ad channels than I do through my other channels, which is just a through Google ads, Facebook, okay. not so much. So okay. you think Facebook's very top of funnel. You're educating the market. You're yep. showing them cool, flashy stuff to get to the site. It usually takes several rounds. Like, you know, the, the traditional rule of seven. So it can take a little time. Google, if they're actively searching for your product, they're more likely to convert. So that you're usually going to have a higher conversion rate through there. So that's why as Shopify sellers, they start to scale. You want to look at, of course, your overall website conversion rate. That's what everyone wants to look at. But then you start looking at your conversion rate per source. So Google ads, yep. email, direct, Facebook, that kind of stuff. But I should be seeing Google higher than, than the, the competition of channels in my, my conversion rate if I'm doing things well. Most of them. Uh, the exclusion there would usually be direct because direct is typically people yep. who are coming straight to your site. And then email tends to be up there as well because they're already familiar with the brand. They see the offer. They know what it is. They might come and shop around a little bit, but that conversion rate's usually pretty nice too. Yep. That's good to know. All right. Anything else? Our beginning uh, Shopify store owner ad campaign, Google things they need to be thinking about, or have we covered most of the bases so far? Um, so we covered most of the bases in terms of the shopping side. The search yeah. side is interesting. Usually I suggest starting off the shopping side because people are so visual. The nice thing that I like about doing the search side as well is, so I mentioned you have like the high priority, medium, and then low, right? So yeah. once you get down to the low, you know what all your top converting keywords are. And so you're increasing the bid, you're increasing the budget, and you're probably in the first like couple positions within Google Shopping, and you're doing everything you can to hold that spot, right? Well, you obviously, just like in Amazon or anything else, you want to take up as much real estate as possible. You can actually then take those keywords that you learned from your shopping ads and create a search campaign so that that way, when someone searches on that keyword, you're showing up in the first position or two on shopping and in the first position or two for search. So now it's kind of like, oh, if I want this, this is who I'm supposed to go with because they're everywhere. Yep. Yep. So that's one way to do the search ads, or you can actually set up search ads similar to how you would do the shopping ads, right? So shopping, I said, has high, medium, and low priorities. Search doesn't have that, but search, they have their keywords. So you have your broad match, your phrase match, your exact match. So you can actually set up a relatively similar funnel structure with search ads by starting off with, I'm not a fan of broad match, so I usually don't do those. But you can start off with a phrase match, see how well it's converting. If you find that specific term that works really well, flip it to an exact match, move it into its own campaign. And same thing, you just, it's like your low priority. Jack that bit up, jack the budget up, let that thing run and just own that spot. Yep. So that way it's kind of like letting your, your shopping ads teach you what you should try with your search ads. Search ads are tough because when people are going to purchase something, they want to physically see it. So the shopping ads tend to do really well. But if you're doing, um, so let's say earlier I discussed, okay, it's an Alabama t-shirt I'm showing, so I want to sell for that. But let's say I'm looking for Alabama gear, right? It's going to be relatively general. I don't know if you want to a t-shirt or a sweatshirt or a hat or something. So maybe now I'm just going to create a search campaign that sends them to all of my Alabama stuff. So now I might do search campaigns that are a little bit more targeted to collections than I would to specific products. That was my next question, which was going to be, what's my landing page for these? And are they different for different types of ads? Shopping ads are going to take you directly to the product, no matter what. That's going to always take you directly to the product page. Your search ads, it's up to you. You can send them wherever you want. I usually like to send them either A, directly to a collection page, or B, directly to a product, depending on the ad, if, it's, if the keywords are specific enough. Less clicks, the better. Do you ever send them to a page like you were describing before where you would have a set of 
bathroom recommended products and throw your bidet in that in that one would you send them to a page like that so okay so that's the top of funnel approach so that's like it's kind of an seo approach a little bit yep Yep. so you think you create a, a really big article top 10 things to have in your bathroom right and one of them is your bidet so what I'm doing is I'm targeting clicks. I'm targeting maximized clicks because I highly doubt that anyone's going to convert from it. I just want to get a ton of traffic. I'm going to search. I'm going to be running ads on people that are searching for, you know, bathroom ideas, stuff like that. And I'm going to get as much traffic to that page as I possibly can. Now you want that page to be more on the CRO side. Like you want to optimize that page. So within Shopify, there's apps where they can add to cart directly from a blog. You can create your own like, quote unquote, like looks like a display ad, but it's not like create your own display ad that goes over to your product page or a collection page or anything like that. But it's traditionally a blog, a little bit entertaining. And then that way, what happens is you're bringing in that relevant audience. And then usually that's when I let my Facebook and Instagram ads retarget them, stay in front of them and try to sell them that way. So it's a very top of funnel approach. And a lot of times like newer sellers aren't a fan of it because really what you have to do is you have to put a budget aside just allocated to getting traffic to the site and you don't know if it's going to convert well or not, there is a way that you can paint the ROI for that. So let's say you set up that campaign, you put 20 bucks aside to get as many clicks to it as you can. You can then set up a retargeting campaign in let's say Facebook or Instagram that's only retargeting people that have visited that page. So that way, if you do that, you can actually look at, okay, here's the 20 bucks I put aside a day to drive the traffic. Here's the other 20 I put a day for retargeting, combine those two, and then there's your ROI when you figure out what that sale is. So there's so a way a to do it, level. but it's very top of funnel. Yeah, that's graduate level advertising right now for our, for our undergrad program here. Yeah. The nice thing that I'm hearing is you're going to use your existing products and collections, and you don't have to build out customized campaign experiences as landing pages. What you've got on your, your site is already good enough to get started. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. That's awesome. So have, have we, have we covered it all? I think at that point we've pretty much covered it all. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So new Shopify store owner, they're thinking about getting into advertising. When should they do it themselves? And when should they call on the experts? I always say that you should do it yourself first. Uh, a, you're saving money on the management fee. B, you're learning enough about the platform so that when the time comes for you to hire someone, then you're dangerous enough to know if they're being stupid or not. Yep. Um, so I'm usually not a fan of working with people who haven't at least done it themselves before so that when I'm talking to them, I'm telling them like, hey, here's what we're doing. I'm not spending so much time educating. I'm spending time actually working on the account. So I always say you want to do it yourself so that you know enough to be dangerous when you're talking to someone. But once you hit a point where you're like, ah, I just can't seem to scale this or it's just not working as well as I'd like it to, then you look at outsourcing it and going to someone. And I highly, highly, highly recommend cheap is expensive. Do not go to some random person on Fiverr <laughs> or like or someone overseas that's just like, yeah, I can do this for $10 a day. Like it, it just it's so expensive to learn that way. And then they end up messing up the account and stuff gets moved around if they don't know what they're doing. Like you've got to make sure if you're going to do it, just get someone who knows what they're doing. Ask for referrals, look at testimonials, case studies, all that fun stuff. Um, but yeah, usually I say you want to do it yourself first. And if I'm doing it myself, where do I learn all the steps that I have to go through? Is there, is there like a YouTube channel you like, a blog place that you like? Does Google have good education? Where, where do I teach myself this stuff? I wouldn't say Google's got a good education to be honest. Google has really great education on like how to find a button and how to set stuff up, but they won't talk to you about structure or anything like that. Yep. And whenever you talk to one of your Google reps, because everyone ends up getting one once they create an account, all they ever do is tell you to spend more money, spend more money, do broad match, open this up, spend $10,000 a week and see what happens. Like that's no one is, it's not feasible for anyone except Google to do that. Um, so there's a ton of YouTube channels you can check out none off the top of my head that get into like the structural stuff, but you can follow some of these agencies. They do webinars and stuff all the time that just show you yep. how to do it. That's, I mean, that's what our approach is. Like, I'm just going to show you how to do it. And if you don't want to do it, then I'm here. So that's kind of our <laughs> approach. Uh, but that's then exactly there's also, I, I yeah, hand out like, my code and say, if you can do this yourself, more power to you. If you can't, then yeah. hire me. 
Exactly. Yeah. Um, there's a handful of like courses and stuff you could take too on stuff like Udemy and all those other cor- Coursera okay. and stuff, but that would be the but best. I, bet. I'm sure there's more than enough information out there if you just do a YouTube. Oh, I'm yeah. a big fan of YouTube. Just do a YouTube search for beginner Shopify Google ads and you'll probably find some very relevant content. Yep, exactly. Excellent. I think that, that covers it. This has been a really good background for people who are, are thinking about getting started in this space. If people want to get in touch with you, how, how can they how can they find you on the web? Uh, anywhere you want. Uh, all my social media is at Andrew Math. All of our agency's social media is at Blue Tusker. That's B-L-U-E-T-U-S-K-R. Uh, you can also email me, Andrew at Blue Tusker. Anywhere you want. Yeah, and I'll include a link to your email in the show notes and, and, and your website. Thank you, well, man. thanks for talking. Appreciate this it. is a, a really useful time for, for our audience. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate you having me on. You've been listening to the Shopify Solutions Podcast with Scott Austin. This podcast is brought to you by Jade Puma, a Shopify-focused agency located in San Diego, California. If you like what you heard, please leave a review and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast.